On behalf of the captain and the crew, we'd like to welcome you aboard Flight 059, now departing to Beijing 2022. Cabin crew, arm doors and cross check. Thank you for listening to us today. If this is the first time listening to this podcast, welcome aboard. If you're a returning listener, we're glad you're back. Seat 1A provides tips and tricks from more than 5 million miles worth of flying to help you take off from the crowd. In today's experience recorded on the 13th of March, 2022, we're going to discuss my recent travel to Beijing, China, for the 2022 Olympic Winter Games. And then we'll wrap up with a discussion about current events in the world of aviation. All right. Well, All here's right. our first episode of 2022. All exactly. about 2022. Back in the saddle again. And uh, I mean, we were both quite busy in quarter one. So some of the episodes were dripping out, but glad that we're back recording again. And part of us being busy was you uh, being involved with the Olympics uh, and the media end of it and being there being in Beijing and having quite uh, quite a flight itinerary. That's right. Yeah. So I do, yeah I um, I work with the Olympic Games uh, in a functional capacity for one of the many stakeholders that are there, uh, and this is just like a short term gig. So they provide our flights. We fly over. We do the work, and we leave. And if you are an avid listener, you'll recall that this actually just happened this past summer for Tokyo because the games got all thrown off their um, timeline due to the pandemic. So with Beijing 2022, you know, the, the pandemic is obviously still a thing. And they had put in a lot of restrictions. Um, and one of those, well, it's, I guess it's more than a restriction, is something called the closed loop management system. Now, today we're going to focus on my air travel journey because it's quite, quite a lot of interesting bits to share. But the premise of that is that we're going into something called, called closed loop. And what that means is, you are restricted to only do your work function and have your life within a very closed off to the world management system. So that means all transport, you could only go from your hotel to your workplace and back. The restaurants you could eat at were only the ones at the hotel. And when I mean closed, I literally mean closed. Like there was a hard wall fence around each hotel. Uh, the venues obviously were the venues you know, obviously you're in buses and vehicles in between, but you cannot get out of them. And anyone in the closed loop could not leave. There was a specific protocol in place. So it was literally a system uh, within a system. And it actually, I mean, it worked well, like we were all safe. And in terms of all things pandemic, it did what it was supposed to, but obviously it was very restrictive and took a bit of a toll on all of us working there, but that's for another episode. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or maybe some other podcast, who knows. But part of this is the flights. So I'm based in Vancouver, Canada. And typically between Vancouver and Beijing or Vancouver and Shanghai. There should be a lot of flights, there's right? Xiamen, Guangzhou, Chengdu. There's I, 20 flights a day, I think. I'm just pulling a number off the top of my head. Yeah, but I remember being like right. when we were there in what, 2018, was it? Uh, yeah, and, and uh, I mean, just going to YVR and looking at the board and flights from here and flight from here and flight from here, like you know, between noon and three in the afternoon. Yeah, it was prime time, and these are not small flights. These are like big triple sevens, A three thirties, seven eight sevens. Actually, there was a there's there a China Southern had three eighty service here, so there was a lot happening. And this general flight path is a ten hour depending where you're going, average path. Well, enter, oh, and don't forget Hong Kong. I mean, Cathay Pacific, major operator, mm -hmm. plus obviously Air Canada. We add those flights. So availability of flights theoretically should have been there. Well, due to pandemic, of course, flights were canceled, not operating. And then as well, because of the pandemic, China, it, it was kind of a bilateral thing. Like I think China and Hong Kong, canceled flights to and from Canada. So therefore, Canadian operators are also 
span the opposite direction. So there's literally nothing going across direct from Canada into that part of the world. So how do you get a Canadian over there? <laughs> <laughs> and let alone everyone else. I mean, the company that I work for in there is literally every corner of the globe, they have people coming to work. So the air travel department was inundated with a massive tasks. I only got my flight four days before departure. Typically, I get it two months out. And being an AV geek, I go mental. I'm like, oh, well, I need to check the seat. I need to do this and what lounge and this and that. And, and so was that, was that confirmation and tickets being confirmed? Tickets booked. Or was that... Yeah, tickets oh, okay. booked. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this threw a bit of a cog in the wheel because obviously then I had to go under the COVID testing regimes required for departure. And there are very specific timelines. You have to get a test 96 hours out and a test 72 hours out. The 72 hours or within 72 hours, I should say. The within 72 hours had to be based on the flight going into China, the last leg. Um, and obviously, here's a forewarning that there it was not a direct flight. Yeah. <laughs> so that threw my entire... And, you know, here in Canada, the travel industry is bouncing back pretty fast. So you have to book your COVID test in advance. Otherwise, you're left with last minute stuff. Well, sure enough... I would end up having to do less of stuff. I mean, yes, the costs were company uh, were covered by the company and whatever, but the practicality of it, uh, I was running to get a test at 0700 on two mornings because that's all you could get and paying for same day service. Like it was getting a little bit hectic because then once you have your tests, you had to then submit everything to the Chinese government for approval. Now, when you think about that general statement, this is something you would think, oh, well, that takes weeks. I literally had two to three days to get everything sorted and approved. So, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, I had to submit my tests. Um, I had to submit certification of vaccination status. Had I had COVID or not before? Was I recovered or not before? Passport and this and that. Basically, submit your life. And it goes into the ether for approval. <laughs> and you sit nervously waiting. Well, Fortunately, it came back pretty fast. You get something called a green code. And it's this QR code that's valid for, I think it's three days worth of travel. And you have to show this along the way. Then there's also the customs entry QR code that has to be done. So this has to be done within 24 hours of arrival in Beijing. So that had to be timed again, depending on that last flight and how things rolled along. And man, if you had been delayed... Well, exactly. Things start, your timing starts to really come into question depending on where you go. So the flight they gave me going to China was Vancouver, San Francisco, San Francisco to Tokyo Haneda, Tokyo Haneda to Beijing. So not all that bad, to be honest. I was expecting worse, but I was like, well, it's, it's not direct, of course, but it's not completely upside down. Just yet. And you're still pretty decently great circle routing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, for all listeners, this flight took place at the middle of January. So there was no Russia conflict going on at that time. Airspace was normal. So we can kind of keep that there as a grain of salt. So fine. I had the flight. So basically everything was timed on that last flight from Tokyo to Beijing. So that kind of came into play when I went to check in. But anyway, we'll back it up. So this is going to be Air Canada onto ANA and then onto Japan Airlines. The flights going, the actual fi- final flight into China was restricted. There were literally only five or six flights a day that Olympic people could travel on to go in. So there was that, that was that flight that I was on. There was an Air China direct flight from Tokyo as well. There was a Turkish Airlines flight from Istanbul, a Qatar flight from Doha, and probably one or two others that I, I'm missing here that I don't know about. But there were only official flights that you could get on. So basically, they were trying to get people from all around the world into these hubs to then join these special flights. And these flights did not have any public on it. Like, they were only Olympic people. So they were quasi-charter? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So what else? Had to get all the paperwork in order. All the rest of it was pretty traditional. You know, online, the check-in, the first two flights, everything pretty standard fare. So... Yeah, got everything ready and could not, don't think I could check in online. Yeah, I couldn't check in online, first off, because my final destination was China. And, you know, obviously the airline computer systems put a big red X saying, no, 
we need to inspect person and documentation <laughs> somewhere before even letting him near an airplane, which is fair enough. I get it. But I had my seat selected. Actually, no, stand by. <laughs> so the first flight would have been on, was on Air Canada from here to Vancouver to San Francisco. So now we have the conundrum of transit. So I have to go through the US. So I have to make sure that any testing I have matches that as well, even though I am in transit. But out of Canada, it's a pre-clear system. So you basically, when you step off the plane in the US, you just... You're in US uh, air or you're in US ground. So exactly, exactly. Now, fortunately, the US system is a little bit more straightforward. It says, as long as you have a test from the day before, like name day, that's all that they look for. They don't calculate hours and times. So if I was flying on a Tuesday, as long as my test was from the Monday, it's all good. So, so in theory, you could have almost have been like 48 hours worth of testing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the seating I wasn't too concerned about on that first flight because it was a uh, CRJ 900, two and two seating. You know, there's not really a bad seat on that plane. Pretty straightforward to our flight. So like down the coast. Yeah. So I go to check in. Now, that 24-hour customs code that I had to do, I was outside of 24 hours because the, the trip was ending up being like 26 or something when I was leaving Vancouver. And plus, if you back up the time that I'm there, you know, two-ish hours before to check in, it's even more. So I didn't have it. But there I am at the counter trying to check in. They're like, well, we need to see the customs code. I'm like, well, no. Because I, I, I can't to, give it to you yet. Yeah. <laughs> You don't, and also you don't need to worry about that. That happens when I am in San Francisco. They'll catch me there, and I'll show it there. No problem. Like, no, we need to show it. So it was a bit of a mix-up, but I mean, they were also correct. Uh, and what I didn't realize is you can apply for this customs code, and then you can renew it, you know, as many times as you need to. No, oh, okay. You basically just have to answer a bunch of questions on this online system. So. It was fine. It was a small stop there, checking. But anyway, they put everything through, tagged everything, good to go. It's funny, when I flew in the summer to Tokyo, the airport was pretty bustling. But then, you know, this is January we're talking, you know, the Omicron variant had come back in full force. People were, I don't know, traveling or not traveling. So <laughs> it, was, it was a bit strange. It was an evening departure out of the U.S. departure terminal at YVR, and it was eerily quiet. It's kind of what I expected to have seen in the summer when I went to Tokyo, which was the opposite. Okay. But this is like all the shops were pretty much closed. I mean, there was duty-free open, and, you know, the, of course, Starbucks. But that hustle and bustle was gone. The place was very, very quiet. And it was just simply the passengers hanging out at the gates. And it was very interesting to see the passenger profiles of people moving. I mean, it, it was so relevant to see mother and baby traveling in the midst of this pandemic. I was like, well, okay, maybe it is so bad. Maybe it isn't. It kind of just raised some interesting questions mm -hmm. about everything going on. So was the flight full? It was pretty full actually, but it was not full enough that I had anyone next to me. So that was nice. Um, it was, it, it was kind of funny. You could see people that were sat together, two strangers and immediately, I guess, whoever was on the aisle was darting their eyes around waiting for boarding to finish to see if they could move. If there was another spot free. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the typical Canadian would be so apologetic when they were able to move and say, oh, so sorry, no offense, but, you know, it's just more room. It's like, don't we get it. Everyone just we understand. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. I would have done it if I was on the aisle. Yeah, exactly. Mask on the whole time. And <laughs> that was another fun part is I got to pick a mask that's going to survive me for, you know, almost 30 hours of travel. So... That was fun selecting one. I did find a very nice one, which was very comfortable to wear the whole trip. So, oh, nice. Yeah. It was a Scotch 3M N95 thing. And yeah, it was great. And I actually wore it even after that. <laughs> so, into San Francisco and step off the plane, and you would never know there's a pandemic. That was just an eye opener. <laughs> like, it, it, we all know that in the US is, you know, rebounding really fast. The, the restaurants were packed. The aisleways were jammed. The shops were full. I'm like, where am I right now? Like, it was just this most bizarre experience. So that, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs>
a friend of mine gave me a lounge pass. So I managed to get over there, enjoy, get a bit of food. And it's funny, all my friends that were at the Olympics in China already, everyone said, bring as much snacks as you can muster to bring because the availability of snack food or just food, variety food is, you know, minimal, minimal or non-existent. So I was that guy in the lounge quietly making 18 trips to <laughs> the food counter to steal a cookie each time kind of thing, right? Quietly sliding it into my bag. Oh, I'll just take this cheese tray. And unfortunately, all the food's all prepackaged, so it's very easy to smuggle out. Yeah, of course. <laughs> terrible, terrible of me. But hey, it was for a matter of survival. So you know what? I didn't care. <laughs> Funny enough, in San Francisco, where there was like a robotic coffee bar as well. Which okay. I was going to try, but I didn't. But yeah, you order and robot makes your coffee beverage. So that was kind of a neat thing to point out. And this was the United Lounge or this was the uh, this was a United like Lounge. Polaris Lounge? It, uh, it was not a Polaris Lounge because uh, the pass I was given to you was just a simple guest pass. So it wasn't valid for Polaris, unfortunately. But that's okay. I mean, no, um, it was still all right. Yeah. Lounge is a lounge. Exactly. Yeah. So with all the connection and a lot of walking, by the time I was only a lounge for. 20 maximum 30 minutes. And I was like, okay, I need to get back. So then on to all Nippon Airlines, ANA 787 Dreamliner service SFO to HND. Flight was not full, but it was a decent crowd. So, you know, I had a row to myself. ANA, one of the and best. And you were on what type of plane? Uh, 789. Nice. Yeah. So I'd already booked myself, you know, a decent economy seat but got on and i just had to do one switch i had a row you know even if the flight was full the amount of leg room on ana was amazing and just the way the seat the design the cabin atmosphere was fantastic and i think you've also been on ANA yeah i flew well. ana from narita to, to singapore and yeah it was uh, very very comfortable very nice layout and yeah just incredible service yeah, the service, impeccable. You're right. I mean, in Japanese airline, cleanliness is of the utmost importance. Like this plane was clean. You know, when they say, oh, they disinfect the planes and clean things down, you get on some airlines like, yeah, no, that's just all talk. This plane was cleaned out. This was, it, it was nice. Like you walk in and it smelled fresh. Yeah. Um, so that was nice. It was a late, late, late departure. I think it was like a one of these 1 a.m. Before midnight? Things. Oh, okay. Yeah, midnight or 1 a.m. or just somewhere around there. So it was one of those fights where they kind of get up, get the meal service done quick and shut it down. And that's what we did. We basically just did that. The, the in-flight entertainment system was incredible. Lots of op- offerings. And yeah, just overall fantastic flight. So did that. And then it was, what time did we arrive? Ah, yes. And this is where things start to get fun. The arrival time into Haneda was pretty awful it was like some fourth oh four thirty oh five hundred type of thing so <laughs> you land and now normally they're sequestering people off to arrive and go into japan and go through all that covid testing regime which please feel free to listen to whatever episode we did that on. episode ah, 50. sorry episode 50 there you go of what that was well then there was a small amount for connection traffic. And on this flight of mine, I think there was maybe 10 of us, if that, connecting. And obviously, we're all Olympic people. I had already put eyes and said hello to like three people. We're all going to the same place. We're all going to next end up on this Japan Airlines flight. So you connect, you know, you go through hallways here and there, and you know the airport's going to be shut down or closed to a certain degree, but you don't realize to how much you then go through security screening one more time. Things are very active. And then you go up an escalator and you're literally in an, a terminal like that is closed and then closed. Like there is nobody there except security guards at doors. Not, I mean, the janitors have come and gone already. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of eerie. I'm like, it just feels strange being, you know, the client, the customer, the passenger in this space mm-hmm. like you feel like you're in a shop turn like witching hour yeah or... it was the strangest thing like i only experienced this when i used to work in the airports and i'd be like first on at like three four in the morning to open up check-in and like you know the airport slowly starts to wake up but this is even before that period <laughs> so no sounds like well you know when i arrived at you know all those years ago and the 
night train into Frankfurt and, you know, finding a place to sleep at 2 a.m. Uh, exactly, exactly. So we're just wandering around. I mean, I, I was doing my own thing because I didn't know the other people and not a single shop, not a single restaurant, a single thing's open. So all you can do is basically sit. Well, all you have is time. So I walk around, I managed to find like those relaxation chairs, like the sort of flats, those laid out long lounger things, which is yeah. great. Wi-Fi connectivity was amazing. Did my calls home here and there, getting everything ready. And of course, it gave me time to do some research to find out what food is going to open when. Because I thought, well, this whole going into China and the food thing so bad, I better have a bloody good Japanese feast before I go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and pick up some more Japanese snacks. Well, yes, but no, because the shop opened after our flight left. Yeah, so oh, it was like no. a 0900 flight or something. 0910 to be exact. I also managed to scope out a lounge. I was like, well, I don't know what, how long it's going to be on the other end until I hit another shower. So there was a pay-in lounge with shower facilities available. So I scoped it all out. So yeah, I kind of just sat around and in utter, utter silence. It was kind of still very strange. And finally, it's like, you know, the sun started to come up. People started to appear and shops started to open. So I managed to find a, you know, a udon ramen tempura Japanese place. Nice. Was one of the first to order. Everything was fresh and wonderful and had an amazing meal. I managed to then go find said lounge. And part of me was not sure if I should just eat in the lounge and then like not go to the, the retail. But I'm very glad that I did because... When you pay into the lounge, you get access to only a certain place. And then you have to pay for food in that lounge. And the food didn't look very good. Mm, But shower, you know, for, as we've said, I think in numerous episodes, if you can research and pay for a shower mid trip, it it makes all the difference. Oh man, I did that in Narita and my gosh, did it ever feel so good. (laughs) Like it just wakes you up. You feel just, it's, it's, it's great. So now you, you were at Haneda, yes. and when you were in Tokyo, you at Haneda at exactly. Haneda. So all the views are very, very, very familiar. Now, uh, when I was there in Tokyo, I was literally our accommodation is inside the terminal at Terminal One. Yes, on this day that for this trip that we're talking about, I was in two or was it three? I can't remember. Anyway, it wasn't the same terminal, but we'll see Terminal One in a second. So once again paperwork, rigmarole, QR codes, this and that, you know, basically the gate verification process before even boarding, you have to go and make sure everything's good. Took a good, well, for me, actually, it was only a five to eight minute experience because I had literally everything ready to go. I had all my ducks in a row and that could be because, you know, I'm coming at it with a very heavy aviation mindset. I know exactly what the agents are looking for for me because all these other people, it was like amateur hour. They couldn't ha- get their, find their documents. They didn't have the right code. They're trying to connect their Wi-Fi. It was just a mess. And I'm standing there being very frustrated. I'm like, you knew this was happening. Why are you don't have your life in order? Anyway, small beef about humanity there. <laughs> yeah. And also that you had experienced it in, the summer with everything else coming into Japan before as well and knowing exactly. international flights during this yeah. rather interesting yeah. time. Anyway, I, I did that whole renew the code, refresh, all fine, all fine. Good, 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 good. So the seat or the, the class of service that was actually booked by my company happened to be premium economy for whatever reason. Like I didn't ask for an upgrade. It was just happened to be that. That being said, there was only 23 people on this flight. Like I said, it's all Olympic. Now, and I was in the sort of pre-rush period. So it's a Boeing, again, another 787-9 Dreamliner, Japan Airlines. My first time flying Japan Airlines. I was blown away. So backing things up here with this whole closed loop system we're talking about, Air China obviously is one of the primary airlines. A lot of my colleagues that had flown on Air China going into China said it was one of the worst flight experiences of their life. Um, the flight crew were dressed up in the whole full white suit, PPE, goggles, etc. They would come around every hour and take your temperature. And if you were sleeping, they would wake you up to take your temperature. The in-flight meal service was rubbish. It was a paper bag with like dried bun and yogurt. And it's like you're going on a 
school trip somewhere. Water service was minimal. Like it was just, it was really a really not good flight experience. And this is told to me by many people, both short haul and long haul, whether it be from Tokyo, whether it be from Madrid, all the same. Business class as well. I cannot imagine doing this from like Madrid yeah, to, uh, yeah. to Beijing, getting woken up every hour. Yeah, exactly. I mean, all you do is sleep to just get through it. So I thought, oh boy, I wonder if Japan Airlines is going to do this kind of thing. Well, boy, was I wrong. Step on just an amazing welcome by the crew. I mean, I don't know if they understand the full extent of what and who they were transporting. They were probably just told you're doing a special flight. It's only going to have like 20 to 30 people on it going to Beijing and you're going to come back empty. Okay. That's probably why they were so happy because they were like, whoa, this is the best flight ever to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our flight back. Yeah. We'll just kick back. Relax. Yeah. Uh, like your, your stories of like the, the return, ferry flights, the return flights. Empty, well, yeah, right? you, you change. And I mean, yeah, it's only a four hour run, but Hey, you take it for what it's worth. Yeah. The seat was, incredible like the premium economy seat and i think cathay pacific was like this too like who needs business class the premium economy seat is just fine like yeah i I don't know how to describe it big it reclined a heck of a lot the the ife was great it was fantastic boarding fast get up and go and i'm assuming this is the same meal economy would have received one of the best in-flight meals I've had in economy in a long time. There was so much food, I was fighting to finish it. And the only reason I was fighting to finish it because I knew that when I landed, I did not know when I would access food again. I mean, that'd be when I was at my hotel waiting to be you know, cleared out of the quarantine. So I was just yeah. like, I got to eat this stuff. It was like chicken katsu sandwich and uh, some salads and this and that and candies and crackers. And then they came around with this like paper cup. Uh, I was like, oh, I thought it was coffee or tea. No, no, fresh miso soup. Unlimited. I had like three cups of miso soup. Fantastic. (laughs) And it wasn't just me. You could hear the buzz because it kind of put all 23 of us kind of in the same area. Some were in the economy part, some were in the premium. It doesn't matter. You could hear everyone's like, whoa, this is so good. Oh, taking pictures. Like it was quite fun. It was really neat. (laughs) Everybody's Instagram account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, so taking off. It was funny, you know, the, the way the taxiways are and the runways are. As I was taking off, I could see the Terminal 1. I could see my hotel room from the summer six months before. It was quite neat. I was like, oh, yeah, there, there's my room. I, I, <laughs> there's yeah, my window. literally. I was like, okay, kind of fun. We took off at whatever it was, nine something in the morning. What an absolutely stunning, incredible view. I'm having traveled so much. And this, this sounds so gloatish. I mean, having traveled so much. Sometimes I don't pay attention because I've seen it all before. No, I was like a kid in a candy shop glued to this window because the way the direction we took off, which I think was a northbound path, it was full views of all of central Tokyo, everything, like absolutely everything, the Tokyo Tower, the whole thing. Wow. And it was like a banking, a slow banking turn. So it was almost like it was like a tourism view. You're just banking. Yes, I said they're filming a video or something. You could see everyone like, flew over to the left side of the plane and was like taking pictures and video. It's exactly what you said. And then we leveled out and continued to climb. And then I just kind of kept staring at the window. I'm like, what is that? And then I realized it was Mount Fuji. Oh, wow. and then we kept going and go. And then we turn and get in line. And again, I, I watched Mount Fuji, like the top of it from the plane for like a good 15 minutes. Did this pilot file some interesting flight plans to give you guys all some great views? Yeah, it's like a <laughs> teaser. Like, ha ha, look at Japan. We had the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when you come back to Japan, fly Jow again. Absolutely, right? which <laughs> I probably would. I, I'm sold. <laughs> it was stunning. Just stunning. Like, And, you know, from a distance, everything, everything's slow in terms of visual perspective. So you're just like watching it, watching it. The sun's changing. I, I don't know. My phone is, I got to delete a bunch of photos. All I have is stupid Mount Fuji with like the wing and the engine cowling. And look at this. And that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, was, that was awesome. Anyway, then there's the meal that we talked about. I'm jumping all over the place here. I did go walk around economy class. You know, I had to go use the bathroom. I just wanted to see again, just like ANA, the leg room and the, the seat with incredible. You know, if I had to go to Japan and 
hopefully will one day with, with family or whoever. Economy, Japan Airlines, or even ANA as well. No issues. I'm not going to bother upgrade. Happy. Just, just looking at it, I was like, this is great. <laughs> so it was, it was a very, very, very nice flight. All of the above. They've been five stars for me, definitely. And the only bad part was it was only four hours. Absolutely. If it was the direct flight from Vancouver, you know, it would have been awesome. But for the four hours that it was, it felt like an amazing experience. And then we land in Beijing. Yeah. So oh, Beijing boy. is a pretty brand new airport, Beijing capital. And the architecture. So relatively recently updated. updated yeah, right? yeah. I mean, and it's got the yeah. similar architecture to the Daxing airport, like with that sort of UFO. The brand new. Yeah, with like sort of orange UFO, alien-y looking kind of architecture, which is cool. Mm-hmm. So for the Olympic operations, they had sequestered off the entire Terminal 3 for Olympic operations. So that whole terminal was part of the closed loop, meaning no public passenger flights whatsoever, only these Olympic flights going in and out. And this is where things just, I mean, I'm not going to go too in depth, uh, but I'll I'll take you kind of to the hotel and then we'll pick it up from leaving. (laughs) So we land and, you know, obviously you get off the plane and we're all going the same path. And first thing you have to do is you have to stand in front of a computer terminal and verify your customs question. So you're kind of standing there. Everybody's in the full white gear, you know, PPE. And you're answering questions, fine. And then you go for your first COVID test, arrival test, which we all knew was coming. Swab. Now, when we went to Japan, it was like the the spit test. Well, this is full swab. So first they do a throat swab. Am I okay? And it was... It wasn't gentle, let's put it that way. Then you have to do the no, the nasal. In all these years of COVID and testing and flights and et cetera, I've never had a worst nasal COVID test in my life. And I thought I was just being a wimp. No, no, this was across the board. Every single person, you could hear people screaming in the other little booth testing areas. It went so deep, so far. Maybe just the quality of the the, the swab thingy that they use. Yeah. It, it actually brought me to tears of like, I don't know, pain or like, when is this over? I almost wanted to like stop the guy by like, no, I'm going to have a swab stuck in my whatever. And an international incident. Yeah. And you just get through it. And afterwards, you're just like, you have to hold your head and like, you're not fighting the tears because you're like upset, but just like the, the pain and like, it kind of triggers it. Like you're, yeah. The Tear primal like, primal instincts or something. Almost. Yeah, you're just like, what just happened? And you just kind of sit there and kind of just regain your consciousness. Like, it was really bad. Anyways, then you continue on and you go through, uh, what's next? You're following, you know, they've sequestered off with hoarding, like, through the terminal. You're, you're like a, a mouse in a maze. You just follow path, path, path. And one thing you start to notice, they have sanitized, and we knew this was coming, they sanitize everything. Anything the foreigners were going to touch. Sorry, backing it up, even like as the aircraft pulled in, the entire ramp crew was standing there in the full white PPE, head to toe, multi-layered to handle the aircraft because they're scared of getting COVID from the aircraft. From the airplane. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm like, okay, sure. Uh, anyway, they spray and sanitize. And again, the reason we said this is a new terminal, well, this terminal looked like it was decades old because the stuff they spray is like this white mist stuff. And it just starts to corrode and all this chrome and everything and the way they wipe it, it just looked terrible. It looked like a city street in the middle of winter with salt spray on it. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this became very apparent when I got to the then immigration counter. Fine. And, you know, pass, passport documents, that part's all pretty straightforward. But they have to take the, the cursory picture with the little webcam thing that usually sits on top of their monitor or on on the desk, the plexi shield in between myself and the officer was so wiped and contaminated. His camera couldn't focus on me. He couldn't get a good picture. (laughs) So it was like a joke. I mean, the guy's also laughing himself. So I'm like standing left, standing right. He's like back up forward. Eventually he literally just grabbed the stupid thing off the monitor, popped it above the plexi, took my picture. And then we both had a bit of a chuckle. And I mean, (laughs) 
they weren't rude. They were, they were also, you can't, can't blame these people. They're also yeah. just trying to do their work and the environment is just ridiculous. Yeah. So <laughs> we go through that. And then another document check here and all along the way, show your code, show your QR code, show this, that again. And it's just, again, something you're kind of used to. And then you just follow, follow, follow. And again, a friend of mine had said, because he had arrived just a few days before, he said, you're going to come to this point, your luggage is going to be there. Like, I, I didn't know what he meant. So what they had done is they had taken a, a boarding gate that would normally service the buses that take you to remote stand where okay. they get off the bus and board on the stairs on the tarmac. They channeled us to one of these gates and there were our bags. They were just there, like all standing in order. No, we're not. We didn't go to a luggage carousel. We didn't go to the arrivals anywhere. We basically stayed on departures level. Uh, And this is how they ran it, which, okay. They pretty much just took the bags from the aircraft straight to this gate, lined them up and done. So here there were, you know, Olympic staff. And we then had to get sorted according to the hotels we were going to. Fine. We, um... You know, you claim the bags, you go out to a bus, you get put on a bus. And here, one last point of ridiculousness about the, the, the sanitizing and the covering up of stuff. You have a, call it a hotel voucher. And so the staff wanted to take a picture of my hotel voucher to verify with the driver that he knew where he was going. Because there was a bit of a small discrepancy. He couldn't use the standard camera on the back of the phone because it had... It was like the sorry, the phone was in a plastic bag, like a Ziploc or whatever. And the phone and the plastic bag ended up being like the plastic shield at the uh, exactly had been so disinfected was, so many times. And so he was trying to use the selfie mode on the camera on the phone because he could get it like right up against the plastic. But then he had to like also look at it to know where to put his thumb to take the oh, picture. Geez. But didn't want to get terribly close to me. I didn't want him to get terribly close to me either. So it was like this conund- like it was just a gong show. <laughs> so, Comedy sketch. He got the picture and eventually we leave. There's only a few of us on us. Now I'd been told it's going to be police escort and all this stuff. So I was, okay, I was very much paying attention. Again, the inside of this bus is covered with this crud, this sanitizing nasty stuff. It's kind of sticky, weird stuff. So we start driving and then I realized the only really reason I realized that this place that we had boarded the bus was a gate is that we were still airside. So oh, we wow. kind of go okay. through this sort of driving circuit. And next thing you know, we pop out and we are literally on the service road that is in front of the nose wheels of all the aircraft at the gates, that major service road that all the, mm-hmm. you know, ramp traffic, airside traffic goes, you know, I, I saw my aircraft. I saw the nose wheel of my aircraft, my Japan Airlines flight. I'm like, oh, okay, there's, there's my plane. So I'm like, ah, oh, okay. So they're keeping us all airside. And eventually you kind of basically do a whole tour, which from my perspective, I'm like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> I love it. I can see I'm everything. getting a tour that you're probably never going to get again. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, all the action. And eventually they spit you out at a security checkpoint. And there's a whole troop of police. So, I mean, there's probably like five different buses and each bus gets a, f- a follow car and a chase car and off we go. Incredible. So we go, oh, before we depart the airport, they had to, and no word of a lie, they came out in the suits, some other people on the ground and sprayed down the wheels of the bus. Wow. With sanitizer. That's when I realized, like, this is just ridiculous. Like, what? How? how? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, really? Why? <laughs> yeah. But okay. Well, somebody's got a big contract for sanitizer, and they need to make sure it all gets used. Oh, we should have bought shares in that. Yeah. So then we go, and we had a police car in front and behind, and there was another bus in front and behind. So there was like four police cars, and we went on this highway, and. I mean, I guess, you know, in China, you can do these things as you would join different exit ramps. There were other police already forewarned who would stop the entire freeway of traffic so we could then merge in and have a bit of a buffer. It was incredible. Oh, wow. like the, the the operation of it was just incredible. Also, yeah, the COVID bus, right? <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Also a bit sad. I mean, the fact that we had to go through this, but yeah. 
Um, I was in one of the mountain venues. So it was a two hour drive and get, uh, you know, eventually you just get used to it and you're on the highway. And, and then we arrive at a hotel check in and you basically have to wait in your room for your COVID COVID test from that airport to come back hopefully as negative. So this was the difference. If you listen to episode 50, I was at. Yeah. You were in Narita for six hours, all waiting for the result. And the whole flight has to wait for the result. This one, they basically get you into your hotel room, which is a very nice hotel. You're all, you're comfortable. You're fine. And you sit and wait and the hotel makes sure you don't leave. And you know, they'll send room service. They'll do everything to make you comfortable. And eventually they get a call saying, yeah, cleared. And then the hotel then calls you and then you're released and then you can mm. go about your business and life returns to normal. So that was a whole arrival experience going in. Wild. Yeah. <laughs> you just kind of, oh, sorry. They sprayed my suitcases down before they came into my room. I forgot to mention that. And. And then you mentioned like the whole thing about sanitizing and spraying. Uh, at one point, somebody was sanitizing snow. Was this on yeah. your arrival, or was that at a different point? No, that was just during, during oh, okay. the game. I mean, the, the levels of this sanitizing and the treatment of you know anyone coming from outside the country started to get a little bit out of hand, depending where you were. And yes, there was one point where they were sanitizing the snow that we had just walked on. Um, they would sanitize the garbage that was just sitting out there for a day. Like it was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So then it's time to go home and so get 30, out of the 30, 38 days later, I get to leave. And this was another flight path that I did not expect. Again, this was booked prior, but we'll share it now. So again, same thing. There are no flights to connect now. Well, I suppose they could have sent me back the same way. There were flights going to Japan and there were flights from Japan to the U S there. Were, all this existed there. A friend of mine actually did go Beijing, Tokyo, Tokyo to Vancouver. Okay. So it, it, it was there, but the date that I needed to leave based on my last day of work, et cetera, the only option they had. And when I say only option, I talked to the air travel because we're all friends there. I said, well, what is up with this? They're like, it's not just simply booking a ticket. The Chinese government has limited slots available and there's passenger load restrictions that they've been imposing on foreign carriers and on and on it goes. And they said, we also don't want to book certain airlines because they have a tendency to just cancel out of the blue if they don't feel it's worth sending a plane internationally with 10 people on it, for example. True. <laughs> certain airlines were also under the gun because what would happen is if a flight... It, it was about the crew. So the crew operated a flight in, the crew then has to lay over. So we're thinking like, say, uh, this happened with Turkish Airlines uh, once or twice. So obviously the crew's not turning around and turning and burning and faring back or flying home. They have to lay mm-hmm. over. Well, the crew has to go COVID test. Well, if one of those crew tested positive, now that whole crew is off. Is out of commission for. Right. So therefore the next Turkish Airlines flight or whatever flight has to, cannot come in. They'd, because there's no crew to take it back. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. The whole interchange is completely thrown off until they maybe then ferry a crew in or bring one replace. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious how they would refer fly a crew right. in with another flight <laughs> from, from another carrier. Exactly. Exactly. So things like this were happening. So that's why it was a very delicate situation. So anyway, back to my point. My route home. Now remember, this is Beijing. Normally, you just cross the Pacific to go to Vancouver on the Pacific Rim of North America. No. Nope. When you told me this route uh, just before, I thought this was your picking because you decided that you wanted to do some crazy routing, and I didn't right? realize. I didn't realize it was because of all of this. Yeah, exactly. And the routing is Beijing, Doha, Doha, Toronto, Toronto, Vancouver. Like the complete opposite way around the world. Yeah, and congratulations, you did a full. Uh, I did an RT around the world to take uh, around the world ticket, and and I thought you were doing it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I, I would, I would, I would do things like that on purpose. This was, this was a bit much. So, uh, it was going to be on Qatar Airlines from Beijing to Doha, four and a half hour stop, and then Air Canada Doha Toronto, which is a one of these rare flights. It's kind of like an odd co-chair agreement with Qatar, but it's there. And then Toronto, Vancouver, 
on Air Canada. First flight, scheduled flight time is something like nine hours and 50 minutes. The second flight was a 14-ish hour flight time. And that last flight is generally about five hours. Adding together all the connection time and the whole hoop-de-loop from hotel to house, it was ending at something like, I want to say it was like 39 hours or something. You put wow. the whole thing together. It, it was a doozy. Even for me, like all the years of flying, I was like, oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> that, have you done anything of that length before? I've done, well, yeah. I mean, I've done. Like I mean, this. like in, in one run? Not in one run. Like I've done a 14 with a two or, yeah. you know, I've done like North America to Europe to South Africa. Yeah. Back to back. Put two but you had, a, you had a gap pens. in between. Yeah, like maybe like a six-hour gap or something. Yeah. But not like this marathon. So it, it was quite the thing. So anyway, on this one, I opted to upgrade, business upgrade, because there's no way to survive this in economy. So if it's a reasonable price, I'm going to do it. So I did it. So the first flight is on Qatar. So obviously, you know, seat selection, business class, the aircraft that was scheduled, 777-300, they have... Old config and new config in business because they're catching up. So originally it was scheduled as the old config. It was 222. I was like, oh, here I'm paying all this money and I'm getting the old config. But oh, well, what can you do? Well, three days before departure, I thought, I'm just going to go in and see if anybody's sitting next to me, what's going on. And they had upgraded the plane. Ah. <laughs> so it was what they called the Q suites, uh, nice. which was an incredible thing, which I'll talk about in a second. Air Canada, pretty standard signature class pods. and Similar to what you flew to uh, from Vancouver to Tokyo? Tokyo, exactly the same. Pretty much exactly the same. Yeah. And then same thing on the homebound run. So departing China, a lot easier. You just have to get your COVID test. And you know by that point, we were all doing our COVID test daily. It was a throat swab, so it was pretty uneventful. But we rec- you could request if you needed the nasal. So I re- requested the nasal one. All good. Paper documentation and gentler and gentler yes yeah and then also the customs qr code thing once again uh so we did that and then uh to the airport so once again terminal three is still shut down you arrive on departures level and it was an incredible scene because it's like this broad wide how do you call it architecture and i remember this from years ago when i'd come in and flown out of there it's like the airport curbside is sort of at a few dozen feet higher than where the check-in physical check-in level is so when you enter off through the sliding doors you have this grand view of all the different aisles like you kind of look above the roofs of the check-in counters ah, okay if that makes cool. sense it's a very nice view. it's a nice architectural feature and it also allows you because they have the screens there you know, you say, okay, check in and counters this and this column J or column B or whatever, right? And you can see all the columns and all the counters. So you know where you need to go. It's a very good system. But it's very eerie when the whole place is dead and literally <laughs> shut down once again. I'm like, okay, so Qatar, I'm like, okay, go to, I think it was actually J. Okay, follow, follow. And there's just like a handful of agents checking in, those of us on the phone. Those of us on the flight. I think there was maybe 53 people on this flight, so a little bit more. So you go and you check in. They're all there in the whole white gear again and again and again. Check in, paperwork, documents, check, 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 check. Right through to Vancouver. I'm like, well, I hope these bags go all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> so fine. Then I mean, there's no shops. Like You just have to continue forward. All you can do is go to the gate. So you go through then, what was it? Security, of course. And right before security is the, what were they checking? They were checking something. Were you sanitized? (laughs) Probably was (laughs) at this point. My goodness. Go through security. And oh, this was the annoying thing about security. You had to take every electronics out of the bag. Now, what's standard is laptops. That's pretty much it. Phone. And I mean, some countries are very up on this whole power banks, lithium ion, everything. So any of those. Well, I had a DSLR camera in the bag. That has never been asked to be taken out of a bag in in, in the last 10 years. years. Yeah. I don't remember having to take a camera. I had to pull it out. Post fact, my carons are jammed. So it was a bit of a chaos. But anyway, 
no big deal. Small details. So we're all there and, you know, me and it's all Olympic people. So whatever, we're just doing our thing, going off. And at this time, there's a Turkish Airlines flight and a Qatar flight leaving at this time. And I had friends on the other. So we're all looking forward to one last hurrah in the gate area. So then you go through immigration, pretty straightforward, passport stamp, you know, get out, see you later. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You then go down and you have to take a train uh, out to a satellite terminal. And what was interesting is uh, on the escalator going down, you can see, you look left and right, all the standard retail Western shops. The, there's a Burger King, there's this, there's that, there's like, shops close, close, close. So it was closed and closed. Very sad. Uh, you go, you take a train out to the satellite terminal. And again, the modern infrastructure is fantastic. Everything's working just fine. You get out to the satellite terminal and there you are. Again, shops, everything's shut. And again, we were forewarned by previous friends traveling saying there is nothing provided at the airport, bring food, bring snacks once again. And sure enough, all there was, was a single water fountain and bathrooms. That is it. Wow. Nothing else. And again, they're walking around, spraying everything here and there. And we're just like enough, really? (laughs) So there's the Turkish Airlines site and gate right next is my Qatar flight. So there's probably 200 people because the Turkish had quite a bit more. So they probably had what 150 passengers. We had 50. So it was 200 people just being social, just seeing hello, whatever, saying kind of wasting time. Cause you get there very early. You get mm. there with like three and a half hours to kill. So even after you go through all this rigmarole, you still have like two and a half hours to go. And there's no lounge to go to. There is definitely no lounge. There's my business class lounge out the window. Anyway, the Turkish Airlines flight, they were about ready to board. So I you know, say our goodbyes. Mine's boarding an hour later. Very important on the time reference here. So I thought, okay, perfect. I'm going to go get online, say hello, do any social media, just to connect with the world before I get off on this journey. Oh, small disclaimer. I probably should have mentioned it. Social media was open for those of us on the Olympic network. Mm, um, so okay. I had access to post on the usual channels. So I'm at the gate. Now on the clock, I have about 50, just over 50 minutes before flight departure time. So I figure, okay, well, at about the 40-minute mark, I'm going to wander over there. And there's only 50-something people, so they're not going to board this fast. So I just get into it. I'm settled. I'm, like, doing my thing. I'm, I can see the gate area from a distance. So I'm, I kind of picked a spot far away back. And they're boarding. I can see people going on the plane. I'm like, what is happening here? And then they come and start chasing us, all those of us in the periphery. So, huh, okay, finish up, pack everything up, shut everything down. And next thing you know, I'm on board at like 50 minutes to departure. Well, that's fine. I was able to enjoy my Q-suite. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was incredible. Like right up to that point, everybody's again standing around in the, st- the silly white personal protective equipment, multi-layered. Like I took photos of one person. You could see like they're wearing three layers. Absolutely insane. They're spraying the sanitizer on their hands that are double gloved. Like this is right to the end, isn't it? And when I stepped on that aircraft, I thought I was going to cry. Like it was like I was stepping out into freedom because there's the Qatar flight crew, beautiful as ever, simply just wearing a face mask, welcoming us on board. It was, it was normal. It was, it was back into normal world. Out of the loop. Out of the loop. Pretty much get to my seat 3A. It was a Q suite with the sliding it had the like a train door kind of thing, like yeah. the sliding door. Beautiful, beautiful suite. If you ever have a chance to find Qatar up there, highly recommend. It was great. It was fantastic. We sat, I mean, there was plenty of time to have, enjoy a pre flight drink. And it was funny, the chief purser came and said, Oh, would you like him? Oh, you know what? Champagne. Need to celebrate. She's like, Why is everybody ordering champagne? We're opening bottles on stop here. She's like, what's happening? I'm like, oh, let me tell you something. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, they had no clue. They just brought the flight in and whatever. I'm like, we are so happy. To leave. And then like, she, after you clear. tell her the story, she's like, yeah, just a sec. Let's get another bottle of champagne. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. So everyone was very happy to be on that plane. So eventually closed doors and, you know, I'm still staring. Even the fuelers fueling the plane are wearing the, wearing the, the white. Wow. Yeah, I was like, this is insane. Board, taxi out, and uh, depart. And that was 
a very firm goodbye to <laughs> Beijing 2022 experience. The Q seat experience, again, incredible. Like, you know, the, you get pajamas, you get the mattress, you get the duvet. Like, there's just so much stuff. The, the screen, the, the monitor was massive. Full lie flat bed. I'm six feet tall. You're tall than me. Easy fit. No issues. I'm a pretty big guy. And usually I find when I go on these life huts, the head to toe is one thing, but to be able to turn and manipulate your body is another thing. No issues. So like all. rolling over or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No issues. The food was incredible. The wine selection was, oh, man alive. Like I was just like enjoying every minute of it. <laughs> but I was also absolutely exhausted because it was like 1 a.m. Another one is late departures. Yeah. So I was like, I think I had my last dessert wine and pretty much passed out. But middle of the night, you know, you kind of wake up in a daze and they had uh, fresh chai, fresh cardamom chai. Oh, it was like being a baby again. Here's your warm milk, sir. <laughs> so, oh, it was, it was really nice. The bathrooms, it, it was like stepping into, I don't, I've never been in a bathroom like this. It was all like wood paneled. It smelled like of like the Arabic rose water thing. It was just crazy, just crazy. Yeah, it was almost overwhelming, like after having been through. But then it was even more overwhelming. So we land in Doha, incredible flight, step off and normal world. And this would have been what, like six? Uh, Yes, correct. Oh, 600. Yeah. Yeah. And we step, I step out and it's rush hour in Doha and the world is alive and passengers are on their way to everywhere and everything is open. And I was just, I, I actually had to step to the side and let my brain kind of just get calibrate recal- recal. That's a great word. Cause I was like, well, I don't know where I am. I don't know what is happening right now because this is foreign to me for a couple seconds here. And then slowly as I started walking, I'm like, that's it. I'm back. It's it travels back. It's a normal airport again, a normal airport. Oh, 600. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was the best feeling and mask on, of course, no problem, yeah. but the duty-free shops, everyone's bumping into each other. The restaurants are just pouring the food out. And again, it was Doha Rush Hour. I experienced this in Istanbul as well a few right. years ago. Right, and we recorded an experience in 2019. Yeah, yeah. It was like unbelievably busy. But then by about 8.39, it just eases off because the bulk of the flights, the transits are done. But it was great. People from all walks of life, all cultures, everyone there. It was a United Nation. So Nice. It was great. It was great. Enjoyed lounge, did the shower thing once again, refreshed, renewed, connected with home, happy, 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 food, good. And then uh, took the, well, so the Air Canada flight. So the main terminal we were in was like the A, B gates. Well, the Air Canada flight was at the D and they have like this internal monorail train that just whisks you down further. You could walk the whole way. Absolutely. But to keep things efficient and just to move people along, they just get you to go up on this train, you go down to another end, and then you join there. And, um, and Doha has a long line, like a linear sort of terminal, or is it spoke? I can't remember. This is linear with a hammerhead, I think, okay. or like a left and right, almost like a Frankfurt style in a way, with two arms at the end. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, get to the Air Canada gate. Boy, was I happy. I, I gone for business class because that was going to be a packed economy flight for 14 hours it was you could tell i was like oh dear <laughs> same thing document check document check document check get on board and no diss to air canada i mean their signature class product is excellent but after you've been on the qatar q suite <laughs> felt like you were flying in premium economy yeah a little bit in my pod i mean yeah. this is first world problem but it was funny. Even the, I mean, the chief purser comes and welcomes you and all this stuff. And she, oh, did you connect my? Yes, I was in Qatar. She's like, oh, sorry, th- th- this is in Qatar. I, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't make it better. So she even knew. It, we had a good laugh. But you know what? It was personable service. Like it was actually really nice service. Like she wants to know everything about the whole what I've been telling you, like Beijing and everything. It was all news to her. Yeah. So it was great just being able to chat with a familiar face and a familiar accent and did the long ass flight to Toronto and mid flight. So very important date. This is February 24th. 
which is the primary day that Russia has since invaded Ukraine or done the first first move. So I am on Air Canada 059, hence experience 059. Yeah. <laughs> on that flight. And you know, obviously this is a podcast, we don't have the visual to match it, but I have a very great photo from the moving map where you know, if I looked at the flight time on my itinerary versus actual flight time, I noticed it was about a 20, 25 minute additional. I thought first I put it, you know, winds, heavy load, and we took off heavy. That flight was full. I looked outside, there was definitely cargo coming on. Like we were rammed to the nards on that one, yeah. probably full fuel load and the takeoff. <laughs> When you take off out of a hot place, those planes have to work hard. You, we you took, got uh, close to the end? <laughs> we got close to the end, and it was like a slow, scenic tour of the sand, slowly <laughs> rising like the phoenix coming out of that place. I'm like, uh, yeah, just keep on trucking there. <laughs> 787 Dreamliner once again. <laughs> anyway, back to the point. Mid-flight, I took a picture of this moving map, and you know, there's plenty of pictures online of this. And right... Just as we cleared the Red Sea, there's a very sharp left turn that we took to avoid Russian and Ukrainian airspace. And we skirted left and kind of across Turkey. Across Turkey. And then eventually around Berlin, we sort of headed back into what was going to then join, rejoin the, the polar route over the UK and Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty neat to see that. And I didn't realize the gravity of that because again being in china you don't uh, a we're busy we're so busy working the olympics you don't have attention to time to pay attention to the news per se when you're traveling you don't capture it i mean yeah there's cnn and stuff buzzing here and there but you don't really sit there and 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 digest it yeah and there's no live news on the aircraft per se it's only when i got back home that i realized what i just flown like through in terms of time perspective so yeah pretty significant day long flight just kept on going, <laughs> going. I movies i think i did three sleep cycles or naps or whatever you want to call it it was crazy absolutely crazy and eventually landed in toronto and that was a bit of another rigmarole so when you land as Canadians, you're pretty much these days exempt from anything. You just, if you're vaccinated, COVID tests, all that stuff, but you can be selected for a random test on arrival. I don't know. It just depends on the mood of the customs officer, I suppose. And that was you? Yeah, that was me. Now I had a connection. I only had just over two hours to connect. So when you arrive, you have to claim your bags. Bags came fine. You then generate clear customs and then you go drop them on a connection belt. You then rejoin with the public. You go back up through standard security and go back to your domestic gate. Well, now I have to go through the silly test because it's been indicated with the sticker that I had. So I asked the guard who's filtering. So you clear the customs part, CBSA, you come out and then the staff there are directing you to the test or no test. I said, well, I do the test, but I have to, I have connection bags. I'm like, can I drop the bags and then do the test? And they're, they're completely dumbfounded. Like, oh, no. <sighs> okay. Yeah, I suppose because it's like, yeah, if you drop your bags and they end up on the flight and you don't pass the test. Well, the t- no, because the test, you, you still fly home and wait for the test at home. Oh, results. okay. Yeah, they changed that at least. So I'm like, okay. So then I joined this line with like 200 people in it. I'm looking at my watch. I'm like, mm, no. Not I'm not going to make through 200 people. Yeah. So I find this time. I'm like, hey, I have a connecting flight in less than whatever time. They got no problem. They pull me out, send me down this priority line, front line. Great. No problem. You register. And then you have to move. Now, the way they build the, the walking paths, like you barely get a cart full of bags through, let alone two. So there's all this jam up happening with other passengers. Anyway, go through another line to actually get the swab test, the whole thing. It was, it was pretty uneventful. I mean, it was easy, just a nasal thing. Then you're cleared. They're like, okay, continue on with your life and your results will be emailed to you. Fine. So now I'm out in the public with my connection bags. I'm like, oh man, now I have to take them upstairs, rejoin the check-in counter. Yeah. And the part I was a little bit worried about is 
my bags were right on the weight limit. One was actually a touch over and they missed it in China. I was like, I can't deal with that. I can't period. do with this because I mean, they'll money and yeah. I'm maxed out. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I need to get them on connection back. So I, now again, this is just knowing how the system works, I guess, a bit of insider knowledge. See, one tips is when you drop your connection bags, then you just leave through a, a, an opening in a wall and you're in the public. So yeah. I went and found that opening. And sh- sure enough, there's just a guard there. And the bag belt was 10 meters away. And there's like a airport worker there who's helped there to help you kind of throw the bags on. So I just went to the guard and said, hey, I had to go do my test, but I'm connecting. I've done my test. Can I just drop the bags here? She just asked to see the boarding pass and some little coach. Said, yeah, no problem. I'm like, thank goodness. So I just carted in, threw the bags down, dropped the cart, and then I was clear. My carry-ons were maxed out because I may or may not have done a bit of duty-free shopping in Doha. Well, I mean, <laughs> why not? It was rush hour in Doha and shops were open. I mean, absolutely. So I was heavy. I was packing. And, and your I, I kitchen definitely. probably, you know, you probably needed some stuff to, you know, enjoy yeah, yeah. after being so, away from family for a month, right? Absolutely. So I was pushing. I, I definitely was an offender on this one. I should have been nabbed. So I go back up. And this is something I had not seen before is to get to the pre-board screening, there's a checkpoint by Air Canada with two Air Canada agents mm-hmm. and a scale and a baggage sizer. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. This is not good. I saw this in uh, in July when I flew domestic. Yeah. I mean, rightly so. They're doing the, the right thing. But I was thinking, oh, man, I have to check my nice carry-on. If they want to nail me, they have to check my nice carry-on bag in. I have all sorts of electronics. This is just going to be a disaster. It's a big pain, yeah. Yeah. So I go to the one agent. I should, and now my Air Canada boarding card was printed on Qatar boarding pass stock. Mm, okay. So I, I show it to her, and she looks at my stuff. She's like, oh, you got to get checked. I'm like, yeah, sure, okay. I then line up with the other agent, who's right next. I get there. She's like, and... The first agent saw me approach the other one and said, oh, I wasn't sure what to do for him. And fortunately, she was a senior agent, this number two, and said, oh, if it's connecting, we just have to ignore it, whatever they have. Oh, okay. I was like, oh. So she said, yeah, go ahead, sir. I'm like, oh. So I, I quickly goodness. walked. But I had my ears open. And she basically was telling her, I was like, we have no control of where they started their journey. And we can't be nabbing people. Like, this, this is, it's... Yeah, it's not fair. Yeah. yeah, it's not fair. Like the guy's gotten through how many airports and now we have to do it with it here. It's just forget it. Yeah. Let one person here. Yeah. Through that For in the name of customer service. and uh... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So go through and oh, so I was like, very thankful. So back security again, back through. There was a guy arguing because he had a hunt. He had his bottle of shampoo or some nonsense was probably 300 mils, but he had measured out 100 mils of Fluid. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. I've and he wasn't understand. Before. Yeah, I wasn't understanding about the whole bottle capacity. It was a good gong show. There. I've been flown for a while, sir. Have you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Quick hop into the Air Canada Maple Leaf Lounge for a refresh. Call home to the gate. Report the last flight home. Again, beautiful air. And how much? Canada. How much time did you have after all of that? Like, I I didn't. I mean, did you have like yeah. twenty minutes? If that, like, yeah. I went to the Maple Leaf Lounge. I was sat there for maybe 15. And then I was like, oh, I actually need to get to the gate next. And when I got there, they were already on zone four boarding. Oh, wow. So if I had nixed the lounge out, I would have made it right on time. So yeah, I needed that all that time with all the testing and everything, which was good that I had it. Step on board, Air Canada 777-300, flagship aircraft, beautiful, you know. Classic Toronto, Vancouver yeah, but at that point, you know, this five hours, I was done. Yeah. I was just spent. I I mean, I ate the food. I don't, I think I put something on the screen. I just stared at it. I was just <laughs> over a it. Zombie? Yeah, completely zombie. Like just exhausted. But it didn't feel like, what do I call it? I didn't feel dirty because I mean, I had my the shower and that part. I felt, yeah. I felt refreshed, but just felt internally exhausted. Like and, just, and disconnected. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So flew across, landed in Vancouver, and uh, that was the end of the journey. And my bags came and everything. And as made the, it. Uh, you know, the, the, the sea and the mountains came into view for your landing. Yeah, exactly. 
yeah so it was good so that that was the that was the journey and that brings us to the end of oh going wow to beijing and back so incredible i mean <laughs> yeah exactly uh hopefully never be repeated again exactly <laughs> exactly so lots to pick up on there and you know as the industry is coming back it's nice to see yeah airports filling up again so and and i'm guessing you know in beijing uh you know when this is all done somebody's gonna have a lot of work cleaning up all of the uh <laughs> the gunk exactly. that was uh was sprayed there sprayed everywhere yeah, yeah exactly all right lots going on in the news these days yes indeed yeah. indeed i mean you know there was uh uh, since we've been there, I mean, there was the frontier and spirit in the U.S., but there was also a situation in Canada with one of, with uh, some of your former employers. Yeah, both actually. This is, I mean, there's a few articles. This is just one from Skiff.com, and it's basically Canada's WestJet Airlines is buying Sunwing Airlines. So Sunwing is who I used to fly for, as well as WestJet. So Sunwing is a primarily holiday vacation airline. They take Sun seekers down south to Mexico and Jamaica and Cuba and whatnot. And that's their primary shtick. And WestJet is, of course, one of the national airlines of Canada. Well, WestJet's buying it, which is quite a quite a big move. You know, Sunwing's got a very complicated ownership because they have, oh, I think more than half is owned by the TUI group in Europe. Mm. So be curious to see where this goes, because WestJet recently became private they were bought up by the Onyx Corporation. So they went from public back to private. It kind of makes sense. They all run the same aircraft type, 737, 700s, 800s. They do similar things. And is this so, a perhaps somewhat of a response, a little bit delayed? Did I can't remember, did the Air Canada and, and, and Transat, Transat thing yeah, fall that, apart or did it stay together? That's a good question because I, I, I thought I saw a headline about Transit formally leaving themselves as a tour company and becoming a full-on national airline, but no mention of Air Canada. So, hmm, that's a good point. But we've seen this trend and pattern in Canada so many times over the decades. So you like these airlines that come and go. Yeah, got called off, get, sorry. I mean, you're, yeah. But yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, there's they a lot of like, low-cost airlines that, that have got money. That Yeah. They didn't lose a lot of money. And, and WestJet, I mean, they there's WestJet, WestJet cargo. I mean, yeah. Specifically, it's like cargo airlines allow, and nobody, I wouldn't have thought of that exactly. three years ago. Yeah, so it's a bit curious to see where it's going to go. I mean, in the Netherlands, KLM bought out Martinair, exactly mm-hmm. the same type of profile, and Martinair eventually has vanished completely, 100%. Yes. It's just all become KLM flying to those destinations. Is that going to happen here? I don't know. Because Sunwing also owns tour company side of things. Like, they have ownership with hotels oh, right, and yeah, tour yeah. companies and things. So you can't just buy the airline per se. Yeah. So, yeah, this is one we'll monitor. Both. I know a lot of friends on both sides have interesting opinions on it. You know, and they're obviously worried about their jobs and seniority and how they're yeah, who falls. Where, where do you fall when it all comes? Uh... Mm-hmm. And we've seen this as well before when Air Canada bought out Canadian Airlines. Yeah. Or merged many moons ago. So, mm-hmm. And and also it's a case of like okay well when you know people fly again and say is some other airline going to start up and exactly. fill another hole exactly yeah so yeah let's see let's see where that goes you bet you and have one about a very unique aircraft I think yes so the Airbus three forty six hundred. So this is an article from Simple Flying. Woken from deep sleep, Lufthansa re- resumes Airbus 340-600 flights. And it's the first passenger flights for Lufthansa for this particular type of aircraft in almost two years. Wow, and that A340-600 is a unique and special aircraft. It's it's one of so the weirdest long. <laughs> planes. You know, you look on it on a runway, it's just like, and, and then you get in as a passenger. And if you're sitting in like economy, you're like, well... Another row, another row, another row. Another whole cabin. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. And yeah, it's like it's um it doesn't look like it should be able to take off. And that that's because you think like the tail should strike against it to be able to get yeah. the, the front end off, right? Yeah. And um yeah, so I mean it, it went from Frankfurt to uh Washington Dulles, and that would have been uh let's see 
March the 11th. And yeah, apparently, cool. yeah, it was a 14 year old aircraft. And then um, the last flights prior to this would have been Cape Town to Munich, March 22nd, 2020. Incredible. Wow. Yeah. That's good to hear. I mean, I'm glad it's, it's awesome that aircraft are coming back online yeah. from sitting yeah. in the bone yard. The one thing that's impressive about that aircraft is the engines. When you look at the four engines on that thing, yeah, because, because of the size proportion of the, the fuselage, the wing to the engine, it actually looks quite, quite powerful. Um, especially again, this is pure ab geek stuff, but following from a, the original A340 200, 300 with a little hair dryer engines, as I call it. Mm-hmm. This is what that plane should have looked like. <laughs> yeah. Five, the 500 and the 600. So, exactly. And I mean, I, I've flown in a few times from, from Germany to a few locations, and it was just like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a crazy airplane. Yeah. So awesome. All right. Yeah. So, wow. I mean, uh, crazy, crazy experience there, wild stories. And uh, this wraps up experience 59 of the Seat uh, 1A podcast. If you liked this podcast experience, be sure to rate us and subscribe. Tell your friends and fellow travelers about us. Make sure you visit us at podcast.seat1a.org for complete show notes. That's Sierra Echo Alpha Tango, the number one, alpha.org. Feedback, addenda, letting us know where you've messed up. You can send all of that to stories, S-T-O-R-I-E-S, at seat1a.org. If you'd like to support the show financially, we have a page at Patreon, patreon.com forward slash seat 1A. Links are included in the show notes. And here's what you can look forward to in upcoming seat 1A podcast experiences. We're going to look at wayfinding at airports and the curbside experience. Uh, we'll also, and hopefully we'll get some interviews here, but see how travel is for those that have mobility challenges, uh, as well as senior and elderly. How do they make it through and what's the best way to make it as pleasant as possible for them? As always, we look forward to your stories, uh, any crazy and wild travel experiences. And hopefully you are looking forward to upcoming travel in the near future this year. Now that things are starting to come back slowly. So if you have any wild things you want to tell us or any subjects you want us to chat about, please do let us know. Excellent. So until the next time, I'm Jeff. Thanks for listening. And I'm Vinod. You're cleared for takeoff. Have a great flight.